Okay, uh, we are at 70 people now. I think, um, okay, let's start now. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Renis and I'm here today with my friend, Sing Yen. And we are going to teach you the basics of our HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So just a disclaimer, this workshop covers just the basics. So it's not meant to help you master like all these topics within two hours. This is not possible. And throughout this session, please don't be shy to ask questions in the chat if you don't understand anything or it's too fast or too slow or whatever. So for today will be, oh yeah, by the way, the slides can be found here at this link. Like, I think it was sent through a mass email to all the people who are gonna attend this workshop. Yeah. So if you wanna read ahead or like just take a look at the slides, you can go to this link. Yeah, so what we'll need for today is just two things, your browser, which is basically like your interpreter for like all the HTML files and a text editor. So just a quick overview of what HTML, CSS and JavaScript are and how they work together. So uh, does anyone here listen to Vocaloid? or know who this character is? Yes, no, okay. So basically HTML is like equivalent to the body and the structure of the entire website. And CSS is like the styles of the entire web page and like what makes it like beautiful and pretty. Yeah, and JavaScript is like the behavior and the logic of the website, yeah. So um, HTML actually stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So um, it's not a programming language. So HTML and CSS are not programming languages. Yeah, so, um, HTML is a markup language. And so it kind of helps with presenting like information on the web. And uh, HTML files consist of HTML code and um, they end with the .html file extension and the contents can be viewed in the browser. So if you have a HTML file or you're writing some HTML code and you want to see what it looks like, you can just like right click and like open with the browser and you can like see it on your browser. Yeah. So this is what HTML looks like. So every single web page consists of nested HTML elements. So each element or HTML tag is like describe something on the page, like headings and lists and links and images and whatnot. So um, they start with, um, each tag is denoted by these angle brackets. And most HTML elements have like the starting tag and a closing tag uh, denoted by like the angle brackets plus a forward slash at the front. So what does this HTML snippet mean? So first, let me just show y'all like what it looks like. So this is what that snippet looks like. It's just hello world. Yeah, so let me just go through like the line by line. So first in the line one, we have the doc type declaration. So what it is, is basically it tells the browser what version of HTML to use. And right now we didn't really specify, but by default is HTML5. Next we have the HTML tag, which is basically like the root of the entire web page. So it marks the beginning and the end of like all the HTML content on the page. And the length equals en is basically like telling the web, the search engines and whatever that, oh, this website is in English. So if a user is searching for a website in Korean or something, your website won't come out. Yeah, on the search results. Yeah, next we have the head tag. So the head of the web page consists of like information that browsers need to know about, like the title. So this title here uh, in line four is actually the title you see over here, like in the tabs. Like it's just the title of the website. Yeah, and if you remove the title, it will just be like the name of the file path, wherever the file exists. Yeah. 
Then it can also contain like meta tags and like stuff for analytics and like links to external resources. And then we have the body. So the body, everything within this body tags is just basically what is visible on the page. So you see all this code here, but you see what the page actually look like, looks like. It's just this text over here within the body text. So internally, like under the hood, this whole website and all the HTML elements are like structured in a tree called the DOM. So basically each website is like a tree and the tree describes how the elements are related to each other. So here we have the root, which is the HTML element. And then this HTML, HTML element has two children. Uh, the head and the body, so on and so forth. Yeah, and this um, DOM, which stands for Document Object Model, can be manipulated like with, by JavaScript, which we'll show later on. So here are some common HTML elements. So there are a lot of, lot of different kinds of elements. So um, for quick reference to what elements there, there are, you can always go to the Mozilla Developer Network, which is like this uh, website with like extensive documentation on like basically HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and stuff to do with web development. So now let me just show you guys like um, what these elements look like in code. Uh, Okay, yeah, so there's one thing you all need to know about, which is um, each browser is equipped with this um, um, developer console. Does anyone, has anyone used it before? Yes, no? Yeah, basically it's like, you all ever like right click and inspect the web page. This is what it is. Uh, this is the developer console. So from here, you can see lots of information about the web page. And most importantly, you can see like the internal representation, like the code of the entire web page. And yeah, so these are some examples of the HTML elements. So let's look at this first set. So we have headings and headings are just denoted by like these H1, H2, all the way up to H6 um, tags. And they are used for um, basically like titles and whatever on the web page. Then we have lists. So lists, there are two kinds of lists. Um, there's ordered lists and unordered lists. And lists are represented by this outermost uh, tag, which kind of like represents like whether it's an unordered list or ordered list. And each list item is represented by this list item uh, tag. Yeah. So this, yeah. Then um, you can actually change like what, like if you don't want it to be like one, two, three, four, you can actually change like how the um, list items are numbered. Um, I think using CSS, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Then we have uh, links. Links are represented with this um, anchor tag. So um, we have, um, each HTML element has this attribute. So for the anchor tag, we have this href attribute, which basically is the URL to where with the destination of the link. Um, it could be a URL or it could be a path, like the path to the file that you want to direct the users to. And within the opening and closing anchor tags is like, title of the link, like whatever you want it to be. So like this, I can change this. Yeah, whatever's inside these two opening and closing text is just the link. Yeah, then we have buttons. So buttons are just what it is, what it is, they're buttons. Yeah, then we have images. So images are a bit special because like um, for their 
representation it is like um basically the image tag is self-closing so you notice here at this image tag there isn't really like an opening or closing tag it's just like this yeah then um for images you have to specify the source which is the src attribute and it again could be like a path or a url and there are other additional attributes you can specify with like any html element in this case i specified the width of the um, image here which is it is what it is like the width so if i change it to like um 100 then the size of the image will just change accordingly yeah, so this is just some examples of HTML elements. Um, by the way, all the stuff that I was talking about just now is all like in the slides. So you don't have to copy down whatever I've said so far. Yeah, okay, so now let me just go on to forms. So forms are a bit more complicated than um, the other HTML elements because it's kind of like, a outer form tag and within it is like this input text. Okay, let me just pull up this to show you guys what a form looks like. So this is an example of a form. Yeah, so if we look at the um, uh, code, we have this outermost um, form tag which basically just tells the browser like whatever's inside is going to be part of this form. Then we have this action attribute. So what this action attribute actually does is basically it tells the browser kind of like what to do with the form, like where to send it to. And um, so yeah, now looking at every single um, element here right you notice that everything is like represented by input tag but it looks so different right that's because um depending on the type of the type attribute of the input tag there'll be different representation like the browser will interpret it differently so and together with each input tag i mean it's not necessary but there's always a label which um, kind of like tells users what this field is for. But anyways, yeah, so back to this uh, input tag. So we have, there are many, many different types. So there's text, which is this text box. Then we have radio, which is, which are these uh, radio buttons here. Then there is uh, dates. So for type equals to date, right? This one here. If you put date, actually, like the browser will kind of like know that this field is for a date, and when you click it, there's a date time pick, a uh, date picker. Yeah, and then we have input type equals to submit. So this is kind of different from a button because, like, a button on its own won't like when you just create a button element on its own, it's not really attached to any form. But in this scenario, when you create an input tag within a form tag with type submit, it will just know that um, it's meant to submit all the values that are within this form tag. Yeah. So, just to show you guys, there are lots of other more different um, input types. And you can view them at the um, this reference here. Oops, let me just, yeah. So this uh, Mozilla Developer Network docs is really useful. So um, a lot of stuff related to HTML, CSS and JavaScript is here, like I mentioned before. So if you're like, if you are not sure about anything, it's really good to reference this site. And so here are some of the examples of the different um, types for the input field, the input tag. So there's buttons, then there are like ones that can allow you to like select colors. And yeah, so you can refer to this document for further reference. Yeah. 
So, oh yeah, one more thing. Um, it's important to um indicate the name. Um, if let's say you have a form that you want to submit to a certain location using this action attribute, um, it's important to have the name because if there is no name attribute attached to the input field, the data will not be sent. Yeah, just to let you guys know. Okay, now moving on to CSS. So like I said before, CSS is kind of like the style of the um, entire web page. And so sometimes, um, you know, when you're trying to access a web page and it loads really slowly, you can see the web page when, without the CSS stylings and it looks really ugly. Let me just show you guys what Google looks like without styles. So this is the regular Google web page and you can actually disable the styles here. Yeah, so without the CSS, the web page, it just looks messed up and incoherent, right? Yeah, so um, this is what CSS looks like. So every single element has CSS attributes that can be changed and styled. So um, let me just explain this syntax. So at line one, we have this H1. So what this is, is a selector. And what I'm trying to select right now is the H1 element, the heading element that we saw just now. And everything between the curly braces is just like the style declaration, like what you want this element to look like. So sort of like translating this code, this is basically telling the browser that I want all H1 elements to have this color, this is gray and font size 12. And all elements on the web page are kind of recognized by CSS using this box model. So you can actually see the box model of elements within the um, console. So let me just, um, okay. So let's say we are looking at this um, label here. You can actually see the box model under the layout here, and you can actually change the values. So basically the box model consists of like the innermost content followed by some padding, which is like additional white space around the content inside the element and the border of the entire element followed by like margins, which is white space around the entire element. So if I edit, let's say I want to edit this um, input field, right? And I'm writing some text here, but I want the text to be a little bit more like uh, to the right or something. Yeah, so you can edit the padding. Like let's say um, I want it to be super indented. Yeah, then from here you can add, okay, but it's best not to edit here. You, it's best to specify like whatever styles you want within the CSS code. But yeah, this is just like um, a cool thing that the developer console has. Yeah, so each, um, just now, like I mentioned, like each element has all these CSS attributes. So um, there are too many attributes like even up till now, like I still have to go on the docs to reference and there's no way to memorize every single one. So once again, it's best to go to the um, Mozilla Developer Network web docs to take a look at what um, attributes there are. So this, they, this uh, link basically lists every single possible attribute ever. And yeah, you can see there are like so many. Yeah, so these are some of the examples. So you can change the typeface of the whatever text in the element using this font family attribute. You can change the font size and color and the padding and the margins, which I've shown just now. Yeah, and okay, but you can just go beyond 
you can go beyond just styling like HTML elements, like all the elements using selectors. Oh wait. Oh yeah, anyways, how to integrate um wait, give me a second now. Oh yeah, how to integrate um CSS with HTML and basically like style your page. There are three ways to do it. So one is inline. So inline, what that means is um you include the style as an attribute in the HTML tag itself. So you can actually um, specify whatever styles you want for that particular element using this style attribute. And the syntax is basically the same. And another is another way is basically within um, style tags within the head tag. So um, basically, if you want to specify some styles, it's all within um, it's all using the CSS syntax within these style tags in the head tag. And lastly, there's um, another way you can do it, which is basically to abstract all your CSS code into a separate CSS file and reference the CSS file using a link tag. So I mentioned just now that the head tags can contain like additional links to external resources and that yeah, this is one of them and it doesn't have to be a file path to your css file it can also be a link to a um, externally hosted css yeah so now back to what i was talking about just now so we can go beyond just selecting like the entire group of elements using selectors so html uh, tags like the, each element they can be assigned classes and ids and in this case they are just used for identification of the elements so based on whatever class or id that a html element has you can select it and style it using css selectors so looking at this, this first one here is saying, oh, select all H1 elements with class container, class like this class equals container attribute and color, change the text color to this. Yeah. Then um, with the different kinds of selectors, there's like this specificity. So Type selectors are like the most general. So like H1, you select H1, it's like the most general because it's like for selecting the whole entire group of elements. Then there's class selectors, which is somewhat more specific than type selectors, which is basically you select the HTML element by class in CSS. Then there's ID selectors, which is the most specific because it's selecting a HTML element by its ID. So selecting based on type is just basically putting the name of the HTML element followed by the declaration. For selecting based on class is denoted by this um, full stop. So if I wanna select every single element regardless of what element it is with class container, you can do so by just like indicating full stop container and then all the styles that you want to declare for that particular uh, class. Yeah, but if you want to select like a specific kind of element with this class, then it is whatever the element is, full stop, followed by the class name. Then for selecting based on ID, it's denoted using this hash. So for selecting all elements with this particular ID, it's just hash followed by the name of the ID specified. And then likewise, like the same as previously, to select like an element with this ID, you got to put the name of the element, hash the ID of the element. 
So there are a lot more ways to select different kinds of elements. So there's, um, for example, if you want to select like a child like of a certain like div with a certain class, you can do that using combinators. So based on the document object model, we can basically combine these selectors using combinators to select elements based on their relationships. So for example, this one over here, what this div space H1 does is basically selects every single H1 element inside a div element. Yeah, then uh, let me just demonstrate like how this works. So, okay, so let's say we have this. Um, hello world element, um, this uh, H1 element in H1, um, within these H1 tags with class, uh, Apple. Uh, you probably want to use a different browser because Firefox likes to escape for this kind. So, oh. yeah, this would work, this kind of editing will work in Chrome. Uh. Sharks, I don't have Chrome on with me right now. Do you want a demo for this part? Okay, sure. Okay, uh, let me just stop sharing my screen. Share screen. Okay, so let me create a HTML file first. And I'll need to open it in my browser. Give me a moment, sorry, I'm not very used to Windows. Okay. That is too big. Okay, can everyone see this? Uh, okay, let's say we create a HTML document, uh, let's give it some content, maybe hello orbiter 2021, um, what else? Maybe we can put this in a div and the seat display. Mm, but we could have. Let me just populate this document. And maybe inside here, I could put with just no, nothing. Okay, so as Rennie's mentioned earlier, you can style something by defining a style tag and you define the rules of your CSS inside. So let's say I wanted to style the H1 inside here. Ah, okay, this will make it better. If I wanted a style to apply to all H1s, I could just select it then via the H1 selector. And I could give them some style, like maybe color goes to pink. And I don't actually know what they'll do. Oh, okay. I guess it changes the font color. But say I wanted a certain style to only affect uh, this H1. There are many things I could do. Like I could observe that uh, this div, this H1 is nested inside a div that is nested inside another div. So if I were to select something like uh, div, div h1, this would probably work. And as you can see, 
because this H1, this first H1 on line 18, is only the descendant of one div. So div H1, uh, this style doesn't apply to it because this only applies to H1s that are nested inside a div, uh, directly inside a div, directly inside a div. Uh, maybe another example I could give is, oh, you could also do IDs as mentioned. So you could label something with an ID like uh, a, H, a H1. And, a specific, and you could apply a specific style to it using the pound selector. This would probably have no change yet. So that's uh, just that. Now the difference between this uh, the original di direct descendant selector is that if you don't apply the direct descendant, I'm, I'm sure this would, I, I'm quite sure this would apply to both of these. Okay, that's not a great example. Maybe if I were to, okay, it will still apply to both of these styles, but if I were to add in a direct selector, mm -hmm. Randy, do you have an example? Um, what can I do for this? I'm also not sure actually. Hey, no, that, that's a bad example, but but hopefully you get the idea of like what different selectors are and how you are able to quickly write CSS in a file. Okay, uh, I'll stop sharing for now. Yeah, okay, so uh thanks so much, Tian, for um sharing. Yeah, so um, whatever thing I mentioned is actually all in the notes. And if you want to know like more information or like have like a reference sheet for all the different um, selectors and like combinators, you can refer to these links, which is basically the Mozilla docs again. And um, this link is really good. I use it a lot. It has like a short glossary of not all, but some of the most used um, combinators for um, selecting uh, elements yeah okay so now moving on to responsive design so nowadays a lot of people like to view their web pages on like different devices so some people like to browse the internet using their phones or their um, ipads and whatever right so we need to be able to style for different viewports like phones and tablets and so how this can be done, it can be done in um, two main ways. One is using a Flexbox and another one is using a media query. So before we get to that, it's important to know that um, when you visit a website using your phone, the browser kind of automatically assumes that you're using a desktop to view the uh, web page. So before every before you start styling or like creating responsive layouts for different viewports, it's important to include um, this in the meta tag. So like I mentioned before, within the head tag, we have like uh, sometimes you have to specify certain metadata for the browser and search engines to know stuff about our website. So in this case, this meta tag tells the browser to use the screen width of the device. Yeah. So, okay. Now moving on to Flexbox. So what is Flexbox? Flexbox is basically a way of creating layouts in CSS. And Flexbox stands for flexible box. And there's another way alternative to Flexbox for creating layouts called uh, CSS grid. Um, you can refer to it at this link. Okay, so how do you use Flexbox in CSS? So it's very simple. You basically just got to 
declare the display of an element as flex. So now let me just show like a demonstration. Okay, so all of these elements are within containers that have um, this display flex and different attributes. So this first one here is a very basic um, flex box. So all we have here is display flex and you can see like all these elements are sort of like, um, layout is in a row and they are spaced out evenly but when we zoom in and the viewport becomes smaller right you can see that after like zooming in a certain amount like the content gets cut off which is not good because like if you view this on a phone you don't if users are viewing it on a phone you don't want them to scroll like side by side so there's an attribute called flex wrap, which can basically tell, it's basically a style to tell the browser to wrap the content of the flex box. So looking at this um, container here, we have this flex wrap attribute here. So if I zoom in, it wraps, but if I turn off this attribute, it stops wrapping, yeah. Then um, another attribute is a uh, flex direction. So you, this is basically to tell the browser how you want to align the items like in the form of a row or a column. So then um, by default, it's actually in a row. So if you want it to just be in a row, you don't have to specify the flex direction. Then there's one special one called row reverse. So what it does is basically the entire original uh, row layout, it will reverse the entire thing. So you see the numbering is reversed and this uh, white space here is now at the start. Yeah, then there's flex direction column. So which basically aligns all the items in the flex box in a column. Yeah, then we also have an uh, attribute for aligning all the content within the flex box. So there's justify content center, which basically tells the browser to align all these items like centered with respect to the container. Then there's flex start, which basically is to align the content left and flex end, which is to align the content right. But Notice like this flex end and the row reverse is different by the way, because row reverse actually reverses the order of the elements. Like if you see here in the code, we specify one, two, three, four in order, but using this attribute actually reverses the order of all these elements. Yeah. Then there's also one last one, which is space evenly, which is to like, regardless of the alignment, just space all of the elements out evenly within the container. Yeah. And there's also other um, attributes you can specify, but for the flex items within the containers. So um, for reference, you can actually go to this link which is basically a sort of summary of every single thing that has to do with Flexbox here. So yeah, alongside um, sort of configuring the overall container, you can also configure properties for the items, like the order and like how much it will shrink and grow depending on the changing viewport size, yeah. Okay, so now moving on to media queries. So media queries are basically like asking the browser for information about the device and other stuff. So media queries, like looking at this, what this does is basically 
okay, first you have to declare that you want to use a media query. And then right now this is specifying, okay, given that this viewport max width is 360 pixels, I want to apply this style. So let me just give a demonstration. Okay, so right now we have this um, blue and red box. Okay, so watch what happens when... Okay, first let me just show the styles, right? Right now I have... Ah, uh, shucks. Okay, okay, let me just show the code here. Okay, right now we have a media query applied to this first box. So I'm like telling the browser, okay, for this... Uh, box, this element with uh, the class box one, right? Once, if the max width of the viewport is 600 pixels, I want the width of the box to scale to 90% of the viewport and the background color to change to red. So you can see this here. If I scale the viewport, when it's not, when it's beyond 600 pixels, it's blue and red. And what the media query does is basically it enforces like, okay, below 600 pixels, I want to style it a certain way. So yeah, this is useful for creating responsive layouts. Oh yeah, and I should show you guys like what happens if I don't specify this meta tag to tell the browser to use the device's width, right? Let's say I'm viewing this um, website using an iPhone. If I don't have the meta tag, okay, I don't know why. Okay, give me a second. Eh? Okay, by right, this page is supposed to look really zoomed out and like, the media query is not supposed to work. I'm not sure why it's like. Why is it not working? The thing and do you know why this is not working? Sorry, I missed out on that. Yeah. Uh, but right when you delete the meta tag, right? Then you view the website like iPhone. Oh yeah, so okay, now it's working, but Basically, what happens if you delete the meta tag is like now the browser will just assume that you're visiting the website using like a desktop. And it would like, based on this assumption, like it won't take into account the width of the device that you're using to view the website. So yeah, it's important to, to um, have this... Uh, the meta tag. Where did my slides go? My slides just disappeared. Is it the first? Is it the first tab? This is the first tab. It just disappeared. Okay, let me just go back. Okay, yeah, so that's media queries and there are a lot more queries you can make, like not just the width of the screen, like um, a lot more stuff. You can just refer to the uh, media query docs on the Mozilla documentation. And so about mastering HTML and CSS. So it might seem quite simple actually, like, but it's quite tedious. Like CSS is actually a lot more complicated than it looks. And it takes a lot of practice to, to master it. Yeah. And practice makes perfect. So you really just got to like dive right into trying it out and Googling and reading the docs. Yeah. So um, also you don't have to style everything from scratch. There are actually like external libraries that you can use to style the pages. 
So popular ones are like Bootstrap and Tailwind. So uh, let me just show you guys Bootstrap. So Bootstrap, basically, all these um, libraries allow you to import the predefined styles that they have. Wait, give me a second. Where is the... Yeah, so Bootstrap has all these predefined styles that you can import and use in your website. And based on these predefined like styles, you can just use them to style the content on your page without having to come up with a design on your own. Like for example, for um let's say forms. Like for bootstrap, I really like their forms. They just look really like nice and professional. Yeah, then you don't have to write a single line of CSS at all. You can just use their preloaded as in predefined styles. Yeah, and they have a documentation for like, oh, if, let's say if I want the text box to look like this, they have a documentation for you to reference. Yeah, but to be honest, it's best, it's best for you to master CSS first. Where did my slides go again? Okay. Yeah, it's best for you to get the hang of CSS first before you dive into using external libraries because ultimately you want to learn CSS. If you dive right into using like an external library, you're more of like learning how to use the library than to use CSS. So yeah, it's important to um, master it first. Then um, aside from external libraries, there's also um, preprocessors. So what CSS preprocessors are, uh, they allow you to generate CSS through this um, their own syntax. So for example, for SAS, SAS has a lot of features like they allow you to declare variables. Like for example, if you're using like a certain color scheme in your website, you can define like variables for like the accent of the website. So you don't have to change every single instance of like that color in all the CSS decorations. Then um, CSS also allows for nesting, which is like rather than using like a um, direct descendant um, selector or combinators, you can just nest the declarations within each other. And yeah, this is just convenient. And then all, like at the end, you'll just, um, the preprocessor will sort of like, the syntax can be converted to CSS for use on websites. Yeah. So now moving on to JavaScript. So for the people that took 111S, um, JavaScript is, a uh, source is actually a subset of JavaScript. So like I mentioned before, HTML describes what a page looks like. And, but JavaScript allows us to add like logic and behaviors to a web page. And it also, it can manipulate the, the DOM. So I won't be covering like the basic, like syntax and stuff of JavaScript because like, it's just, it's quite simple. So you can refer to this link, learn X in Y minutes for JavaScript. And this link actually has like a short summary of like what the syntax looks like, what are the different constructs that are available for JavaScript, like the switch cases and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so moving on, how do we integrate JavaScript together with HTML? So there are two ways, using a script tag within the head, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the head. It can kind of like be anywhere, but um, usually people put it in the head. And um, the other way is also to use, uh, basically abstract all the JS code out into a separate file and link it in the head to be used in the 
HTML file. So let me just go into one example. So let me just. Okay, right now, let me just show the code first. So looking at this, what this code does is, is actually a counter. So we have this button here with this onClick attribute. This onClick attribute is actually an event listener. So uh, we shall talk more about later. So what it does, it will listen, it will sort of like listen for this event where users click on the button. So once this button is clicked, it will fire this count function, which keeps track of the count and sends an alert to like on the browser. Let me just show you guys what it does. So based on the number of times I press the button, there'll, uh, there'll be a dialog coming out. Yeah, to basically count the number of times to that I've pressed the button. So this is one example of how JavaScript can be integrated into your web page. Obviously, like it can be used for more useful things, like not just for counters and whatnot. Yeah. Then um where did my slides go again? Oh, okay. Yeah. Then next we have manipulating the DOM. So what does manipulating the DOM mean? Is basically you can change whatever, whatever HTML code you have already written on your website. So looking at this code, what this does, this document dot query selector. The query selector is basically selecting H1 elements like Okay, let me rephrase. So this document is referring to the entire HTML document right now. Then dot query selector is basically a method to select all the H1 elements in the page. Then dot inner HTML is basically what this chain re returns is the inner HTML of that element. And let me just demonstrate like in total what this code does. Okay, so right now we have this um, full heading. Then when I click, okay, let's just look at the script from here. So when I click, what it does is basically the function will select this H1 element here, foo, and change its inner HTML to bar. So when I click, it will change to bar. Yeah. So in this sense, it's manipulating the DOM because you're, you're changing the inner contents of the H1 tag, the H1 element. Yeah. Then um, there are a lot more ways you can manipulate the DOM. So there's also get element by ID, which basically returns the element with the given ID attribute. So let me just sort of demo again. Like, let's say I have this, uh, this H1 has an ID of Apple. Oh, this stupid thing. Okay, let me just do it here. So this H1 element has a ID of Apple. And then I can grab this element through the, let's, let me just show a simple like one liner here. If I do document dot select uh, get element by ID Apple, Yeah. Okay. Have you is... refreshed the page? 
Oh, shucks. Yeah, it works. Okay, yeah. So yeah, if it's... I do document dot get element by ID Apple, sorry, the inner HTML. Why isn't this working? Uh, uh, check the inspector first to see, to see if there's really something with the ID of Apple. Why is why isn't? Uh, is this the same document? JS example one. Oh, sorry, I edited the wrong document. Yeah, so uh, for those who are watching, uh, actually this happens to me as well. So sometimes when you find like things don't seem to be working, you can check like is it the same file you are editing or have you refreshed your page? Uh, later if we have time, we can maybe we can show some examples of what uh, some some library that you might use for your project would be what working with a library you might use for your project would be like uh, if we have time. Yeah, back to Renny, sorry. Okay, yeah, so right now I have this H1 element with the ID Apple. And so what document.get element by ID does, right? It will just return this H1 node over here. Yeah. Then dot in our HTML will grab the whatever is between the HTML element. Yeah. So do you guys understand what this function does? Like, or is anyone confused? Yes, no. Okay, yeah, um, let's just move on. So actually, right, using all this information that we have spoken about so far, um, we can create like a small website. Let me just show you guys, right? So this is um, sort of like fake portfolio website. And all of the stuff here is created. And basically all the code here is from what we have learned so far in this um, lesson. So if you see here, there's this navigation. And let me just explain how it works. So, Right now, how this navigation works is, first I will have a div here with an ID main that contains nothing. So that's why when we enter the website, like originally, like it's blank. Then when you select a link, what it does is within this um, JavaScript here, within this um, on-click listener, what it does is it will grab the element, this main element, and change its inner HTML to the inner HTML of the other divs, like about and experience, which are all hidden. Yeah, so um, I think it will take a bit too long to like go through all of this in detail. Do you guys want me to go through this document in detail? Or is it like a bit much? Uh, maybe you can quickly skip through the contents of the document. Uh, don't really need to go through, I guess. Okay, yeah. So um, I would say the main feature about this is basically using this uh, JavaScript to switch between the different contents of the different divs. So, um, when you first enter the website, the main stuff that you can see is up here. So it will just be this. And all the, the rest of the divs with all the contents are hidden. So this is done using this um, display none attribute for the divs with the IDs about experience and contact. So through the navigation, when you click, basically there'll be some JavaScript to swap out the contents of this uh, main div with the rest of the 
um, contents in the other divs. Then um, actually this method was quite popular in the past, like um, back in the days where like uh, block spot was popular. This was how people like did like navigations and and stuff on their website without having to create like separate pages. Yeah. So anyways, this is just a demo of what you can do with the stuff we have learned today. But please don't use this like method to make your portfolio. Like use like a static site generator or something instead. Yeah. Then um, now moving on to event listeners. So one example of event listeners that was seen just now was this on click attribute. So what, it's not really attribute, it's like an event listener, but it looks like an attribute. So like every single user interaction with a page is like an event. So whenever you click something or your mouse moves or your mouse hovers over a certain element on the page, it's all an events. And also when you scroll like a page, it's also an event. And there are many, many different types of events. And based on these events, you can change the layout and um, basically do stuff on the page using functions, which is what I showed just now here. When the user clicks on the link, it will execute this JavaScript code. It can just be a function name or it can just be the code outright. But I think the best practice is to use the function name instead. Yeah. Then uh, I'm not sure what to demo for this other three uh, event listeners because like I, I couldn't think of any examples do you have any examples that you can think of uh, I don't think you really need examples for that but you just need to keep in mind what these events are what when these events are dispatched so they are exactly what their name suggests uh, your browser will fire off all these events like for example when your mouse moves or let's say you had an element like a button where you you indicate that on mouse enter something else should happen in the page and by something else it's really up to you to define because the function that uh you the the function to handle the event is really up to you to write so you could do all sorts of funky shit like even open another page or the, okay maybe you shouldn't do that uh but you could manipulate any part of the dom you wanted honestly so Besides like these events that Renis mentioned, right? There's a whole bunch of others uh, on click, on submit, what else? Uh, I think hover maybe. And yeah, yeah uh, can you open the event reference in fact? Yeah, we, we can quickly skim through it now to get an idea of what things they are. Yeah, you have animation. Wait, no, are uh, these really events? Uh, keyboard especially like, Say you were building a basic uh, game from scratch in JavaScript in your browser, uh, you will probably want to hook on to keyboard events, mess, um, not mess, mouse media, uh, even like media resize apparently. And yeah, so keep in mind that these are all the things that are available to you that you can listen to and then handle because all these are events dispatched by your browser. Yep. Then, okay, moving on. Where is my slides again? <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah. So, what now? Now that you have all this knowledge, right? Like, so moving on with this, like, basic knowledge, you can start to obviously you got to start to practice the knowledge you have learned. And um, actually with this knowledge, you can start learning how to use some frameworks. And to be honest, the best way to master what you've learned is to build your own project. 
And I think a good starter is to create your own portfolio using a static site generator like Jekyll or Hugo. I'm not really sure how to explain in detail what it is. But um, basically, a static site generator is, um, is using JavaScript and APIs and like Markdown to generate a website. Do you know how to explain? How do you explain what a static site generator is? Sorry, I was muted. So a static site generator is something that generates a static site. And by static, uh, what static means is it doesn't talk to a server. So the content there is all static and really they are just like HTML files that are just already present and are not being generated on the fly by a server when you request for them. So uh, the examples that Rene gave, right, right, Jekyll, all these are popular static site generators. I think Jekyll uses Ruby. Ruby's Ru yeah, it uses Ruby. Yeah, so typically what these things do is they pass some kind of uh, more readable format. Like you've probably seen markdown files. Uh, there's a bunch of others, I think, org files. Not sure what else they pass. I think some weird ones pass text files as well, like plain text files, which is quite interesting. And from, from the content you've written inside these markdown files, they generate an entire HTML, CSS page with you. Sometimes they might have JavaScript and really it's up to you to customize. So in fact, Rennie, do you want to quickly show an example of GitHub pages? Oh yeah, okay, wait. How, how do I, like um, our website or? Just go to, <laughs> just open your 203 page. <laughs> oh my God, okay, yeah, so. Basically for 2103 for um, the CS people or whoever who are gonna take 2103, like y'all will be doing documentation on a static site generator. I think it's Jekyll. I can't really remember, but this is what, this is what my 2103 project page looks like. Why is it loading so slow? Okay, yeah. So all of this is actually generated using Markdown. So you see all these like um, details and like the headings and the contents page and everything. And uh, let me just show what it looks like, like the repo. So in this in this report that Renis is going to show, you pro you probably see like some markdown files. So what happened was the static site generator, right? Like passed those markdown files and then generated the entire site you saw just now. So you usually get a lot of control over these things. Uh, like you get to customize the CSS, you get to use other people's CSS, whatever that they've written. And I think that, yeah, Banner has shared a link to static site generators if you are interested in them in the chat. Yeah, so basically this entire, um, where are the, yeah, so this, that entire page was generated using, hey, it's not marked down. They used like this. Uh, yeah, so in this example, it wasn't marked down. It was another format called a doc. Yeah. Not sure what it is, doc maybe. Yeah, so, Oh, it doesn't show the code on GitHub. Yeah, so what it looks like is like just like this marked up text. Then the static site generator will pass this marked up text and generate it to a HTML page with like lists and tables and everything for you. And then where the HTML CSS stuff comes in is when you style what you want your page to look like, is it here? Yeah, here. Then the, the um, static site generator will basically pull the styles and um, whatever um, includes that you have. How do I explain what includes are? Okay, but yeah, this, you just gotta read up on it and experiment with it. 
Yeah. Yeah. So static site generators are a great way to like quickly spin up a personal page. You could, of of course, you could write it from scratch, or uh, even you could do other things like WordPress. But static site generators are nice because they are they generate statics static sites, which means it's usually lightweight and you have a lot of control over everything. Yeah, exactly, yes. Okay, so, and conclusion is front-end development is more than meets the eye. So it's like, it's beyond like just HTML, CSS and JavaScript. There's a lot more to it and you really gotta like dive right into it. Like to my knowledge, are there any mods that teach web development? I'm not sure, but there are some modules that do touch on web development, like 3249 is really good. Like it talks about GUI architecture and it's good. You should take it. Yes. But the workload's really high though, so just letting you guys know. Then um there's 3240, which is sort of like teaching about user interface design like how to create beautiful web pages and like design like the heuristics and i think there's some it teaches some html css like more in depth then there's this three to six but i'm not sure whether it's still around see and do you know if it's still around no well, i'm not too sure but I think one mod that we can mention as well is 3216. Although it's not exactly like a web development mod, right? Uh, it's a, really a project-based project, project -based mod. Uh, it is a very good opportunity for you to practice like building web applications. And in fact, I think I haven't taken the mod, uh, but I know they do build a lot of web projects there. And in fact, I think some uh, one of the TAs, Han Ming is here. Han Ming, uh, if you're able to unmute yourself, would you like to share more about it? Or maybe in the chat, if it's not so convenient for you. Uh, sure, I can share more about 316. Do you yeah. want to share yeah. your screen? Uh, I don't or have like much to share. Show screen. off your projects or something. Yeah, okay. maybe you can just uh, quickly like uh, elaborate on how what 3216 is and how it links to like, web development, I guess. Okay, let's give him a second. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, uh, so 216 actually is more about like, um, I guess you can build anything you want, but generally people like to build web apps. One of the assignments require you to build web app. And um, for, so for funding project, generally people also just move on to build web app. Lah. And uh, generally the focus of the app or the module in the, as a whole is to build apps that make an impact. So for, for a final project, we are you're kind of graded based on um, how many users you can actually get and whether you're actually solving the a real problem that quite, uh, that needs to be solved. Lah. So uh, I'm not sure what I can share on my screen. To Let me see. Uh, maybe I'll share my screen. Lah. Let me see. Yeah, so for my team, we this was the project that I built for my when I took it. Um we helped to build an app that allows helps the helps people to trade private equity. Right. So the problem was that there was uh there were individuals that actually wanted to clear their shares, right? Uh for their private equity. Lah, and they couldn't find enough buyers. So they wanted to build a kind of a dark pool trading system, right? That you can kind of basically log uh join with a LinkedIn account, then actually kind of post bits and uh, uh, okay, I, I don't think I want to share too much of the interface, lah. but um, basically can say that you want to buy or want to sell shares and so on. So some of the other past projects, uh, like from, from last batch, some of them include like, um, for example, kind of like a podcast based, kind of podcast like TikTok, right? This is one project that one team built, right? which is something that actually, I think uh, Facebook is looking into right now. And also I think a lot of other Social media platforms are also looking into, which is like basically sound bites and so on. So basically, 316 actually is a good chance, good avenue for you to kind of explore ideas that you have. And some of the teams come up with really brilliant ideas. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is a bit informed too. So I hope this helps. Yeah. 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 
thanks Hanming for that. So if you are interested in building such applications, then you can consider taking 3216. Mm, other than that, okay, uh, Rennie, do you think there's time for me to show a quick demo or something like maybe a re React? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Okay, uh, so the purpose of sharing, of doing this demo, right, is, I think is. wait, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's very possible that for your orbital project, you might end up using a library like maybe React or Vue. Mm, so these are JavaScript libraries that pretty much generate a page for you, kind of. And I want to tie in the concepts of React because even though it's a JavaScript library, it's really built on the HTML and CSS that we have covered today. And of course, the JavaScript. Uh. So first thing first, how do I use this thing? Hey, how do I open a terminal? Sure, that works. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really not, not used to Windows because I rarely develop on it. Okay, but let, while I'm waiting for this to load, let's take a look. Uh, this is a typical React project that was generated using the command line tool from their documentation. Uh, it seems to do a bunch of things. Uh, this, I think this was briefly mentioned earlier, document.getElementById. So there's uh, somewhere in the document, there's something called, there's something with the ID of root, and then we retrieve it and somehow we pass it as an argument to this react-dom.render function. So, what it basically does is like all the HTML generated by React will be injected into this element with the ID root. Yeah, I think that's in the, is that an index.html or something? It should be, in fact, maybe like inside the public. Yeah, yeah, it's there, it's there. Yeah. Yeah, so, then there's a single div that is like empty with ID root. Then React will inject everything that has been generated into this uh, div. Yeah. Okay, it's really slow now. I'm not sure why, but you can see that this HTML file, right, doesn't have much HTML. But somehow you write all, you, let's see, is this an example? You write a bunch of stuff over here in a JavaScript file, and it should appear in. It kind of appears over here. Like I'm not really zoom in, but you can kind of see like there's a div class app class name app header, uh, which basically corresponds to the HTML here lah, the code. So what how this ties in is. All this is actually JavaScript. It's not actually HTML. What happens is the real library will at some point read through all this. And although this looks like HTML, it's actually JavaScript code. You, you turn all this JavaScript into valid HTML onto your app here. So this is nice because it allows you to develop entire pages, oh, sorry, entire applications purely in JavaScript. So all the logic and in this example, they still split it out into a CSS file, but it's possible that you might see projects where even the CSS is done inside JavaScript itself. So pros and cons to this approach, uh, some people like it. Uh, this is probably something that you can explore in your own projects as you're building on your Orbital project. So that's all. That's really all I wanted to show for this demo about how all this ties into the HTML and CSS underneath, because even though this is very much a JavaScript library, like it's still built on top of all these technologies that we covered briefly today. La. So that's all from my brief demo. Yep. Then, okay, let me just um, share my screen again. So yeah, and yeah, one last way you can learn about all these like web development related technologies is to come for NUS Hacker School. Like we may not teach specifically just web development related topics, but there is some like, um, actually I think there's a React workshop happening later on today. Is it? I, I can't remember, but 
yeah, I think it's in the line of the workshops and yeah, just come uh, just come for should, hacker school. You should disable that notification. <laughs> yeah, just come for hacker school. Then uh thanks so much for attending and I hope you guys have learned something. Yes, you can just look at my slides or visit my GitHub. Um Actually, you can just visit the, like for all the code examples that I've shown today, you can visit this uh, GitHub link. Let me just, uh, where is it? Oh, it's here. Yeah, you can visit this uh, repo here. Let me just copy the link. Yeah, and within code is all the, code examples that I've shown so far and you can like experiment with it and whatever. Let me just, where's the chat? How do I insert this into the chat? Yeah. Then, yeah, then um, if you have any questions, you can like email me or Jingyan, I guess, then um, or join the NUS Hackers Telegram chat if you have any questions like on whatever programming related, tech related stuff. And also follow us on Instagram. Yeah, if you want to attend our events, all the updates on our events will be there. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Mm. So I guess this kind of concludes the HTML workshop. But if you all have any questions regarding your project, uh, can stick around a bit and then ask in the chat or PM if you are feeling shy about it. Or maybe you have an idea and you want to ask questions like whether it's feasible. We are not your advisors, but maybe we can point you in directions you can explore. <laughs>